Ever since Israel began its murderous onslaught against Gaza, the Western media has dripped with racism, unsubtle racism, towards the Palestinian people. Now, that's been a position expressed by me and many others, not least of all, most importantly, of course, Palestinians. Those opposed, certainly, to the current slaughter from the start. Now, it's manifested itself in many different ways, such as the way even Palestinians, who've nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Hamas, who've lost multiple family members and loved ones because of Israeli weapons, are interrogated on television as if they're in the dock in a court, where they're ordered to condemn Hamas and indeed treated with far more aggression than the average official spokesperson for the Israeli government or army. But it's principally manifested itself in a complete contempt for the value of Palestinian life. There's nothing remotely subtle about any of this. Any loss of Israeli civilian life is rightly seen and portrayed as intolerable. But Palestinian life is treated as having little to no worth whatsoever. Tens of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza are suffering horrific deaths thanks to direct violence, bombs, bullets, as well, of course, as the collapse of the medical system, the lack of food, clean water, shelter, and so on. But as far as the media is concerned, while a single civilian death on, the, on Israel's side would rightly again be seen as an outrage, there is no limit at all to how many Palestinians can be killed. And that's even when most of those killed are women and children, with 334 times as many Palestinian children, including babies, including toddlers, suffering violent deaths as Israeli children who were outrageously killed on the 7th of October. Now, it shouldn't also need to be said, but I will say it, that so many of the Palestinian men, from medics, journalists, aid workers, emergency responders, to just ordinary citizens who've been killed, have committed no other crime than being Palestinians who live in Gaza. Now, we've also seen repeatedly how Western media outlets describe Israelis as being killed, but then say Palestinians die, as though they're just randomly keeling over with some unknown cause of death. Now, all of this has been glaringly obvious in my view from the start, and again, most importantly, glaringly obvious to Palestinians. And yet still, I find it profoundly shocking. I've worked in the British media now for 13 years. I'm well aware of the rampant racism that often defines it, but I've just found it still shocking because it's so ragingly unsubtle. But the point now is we've got actual empirical evidence, which shows that our claims are proven beyond any doubt. Now, a detailed study by two researchers has gone through the BBC's reporting of Gaza and Israel. It has examined, not just Gaza, sorry, the West Bank, Gaza and Israel, occupied territories, examining 600 articles and 4,000 live feed posts between 7th of October, when this carnage began, and the 2nd of December 2023. Now, I say when this carnage began, obviously, there was a context before the 7th of October, but this is importantly when they begin this round of horror which they look at. Now, the researchers say they don't necessarily capture all the articles because of the limitations of the BBC search mechanism, but they believe it is a very large and representative sample, over 90% plus of articles present in that time frame that they look at. This was, in their words, an attempt to surface the syst systematic disparity in how Palestinian and Israeli deaths are treated in the media. They run individual sentences through a natural language processing system. Now, that's a branch of artificial intelligence, which gives computers the power to understand text and spoken language like a human being, in this case called Stanford Cree NLP. I'm sure those who are AI buffs know far more about it than myself. Now, they then use these results to identify sentences with mention of death, and they manually tagged each one as referring to Palestinians, to Israelis, or neither or both. So this was done manually by the two researchers, rather than the computer. They had specific rules. The victim had to be either Palestinian or Israeli, or the death otherwise happened in the West Bank and Gaza or within the pre-1967 borders of Israel. They exclude speculative deaths, that is, someone may die, injuries, or deaths must have happened on October the 7th or since. What they find is truly shocking. I mean, it might not be surprising, but it is shocking. Bear in mind, when we go through these results, far, far more Palestinians have been killed compared to Israelis. Now, at the end of the time frame used by the researchers, around 18 times as many Palestinians had suffered violent deaths compared to Israelis. It's now, I'm, of course, sorry to report much, much more. So over this time frame, the number of Israeli deaths actually fell because Israel revised down its death toll from the 7th of October. The final death toll is believed to be around 1,139, including 695 Israeli civilians, 36 of whom were children and 71 foreigners. Now, by the end of December, according to the independent NGO Euromed Human Rights Monitor, 
over 21,000, so the beginning of December, over 21,000 Palestinians had been killed, including over 8,300 children and an estimated 19,660 civilians. Now, I'm using a higher death toll than that used by these researchers. They're referring to the official death toll. I mean, it's still obviously much, much, much higher, well over 12,000 by the end of their time frame. Now, even that number is denigrated by apologists for this appalling massacre of Palestinians on the basis they come from the Hamas-run health ministry. But in previous conflicts, the final toll of Palestinians, death toll, has been subsequently confirmed by Israel and the United Nations. At the end of October, all the names, personal details, and Israel-approved IDs of all deaths at that point were released to prove that the numbers being released are credible. Independent aid agencies have well, have also said the figures are entirely credible. But actually, they're underestimates. That's why I'm using a higher toll, because they exclude those buried under the rubble who are clearly dead. I'm sorry to have to keep saying that, but it's true. And it's also reasonable to say that actually you're a med human rights monitor almost certainly significantly underestimating the actual death toll because violent death deaths are one thing but we don't actually know the full number dying because of untreated underlying health conditions disease lack of food clean water and so on that's the so-called excess death toll which will not be clear for a long time if ever not well, not actually the proper total but the graph of mentions on the bbc website of israeli versus palestinian deaths is frankly just shocking. Not surprising again, but shocking. So at the beginning of this current horror, there were significantly over 100 mentions of Israeli deaths on two dates, so just shortly after the 7th of October. Um, the highest it ever reaches for Palestinian deaths in this time frame is around 70 on one day. Generally, throughout October, it fluctuated between 20 and 60 mentions. In the first part of November, between 40 and 60 mentions, before plunging to below 40 mentions in the final part of December, Indeed, actually, eventually below 20 mentions. So in October, mentions of Palestinian deaths compete with mentions of Israeli deaths. In the first part of November, there are generally more mentions of Palestinian than Israeli deaths, though that dips, and by the end, there are a similar number of mentions. But again, consider the statistical context here. Greasy to just say statistical. We're talking about human beings here, but you know what I mean. The vast majority of Israeli deaths happened on a single day. Those, that is Israelis killed, of course. That's the 7th of October. Of course, there are still reasons to discuss, clearly, those Israelis who were killed. October 7th was an extremely important historical event for all the wrong reasons, with a truly horrendous civilian death toll in its own right. It will rightly be discussed at length for generations to come. It was a huge trauma for the people of Israel and beyond. Um, and of course, we'd expect it to be discussed at length in the first few weeks. There are also deaths that are confirmed of those previously classed as missing in the days after the 7th of October. There are hostages who are subsequently killed or are confirmed as killed. There are Israeli soldiers killed in combat. All of that, of course, is newsworthy. But overall, there was a huge Israeli death toll on one day, the 7th of October. And then a huge number of Palestinians are killed every single day since, with a much bigger, much, much bigger overall number of Palestinians killed. Indeed, the number of Palestinians killed exceeded the number of Israelis killed on the 7th of October within the first week. So that means proportionately, the amount of BBC coverage per Israelis who have been killed is much, 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 much bigger than the amount of BBC coverage per Palestinians who've been killed. Now, it's also striking how different language is used. This is really interesting. There are 51 uses of mother or grandmother in reference to Israelis who were killed compared to 32 in reference to Palestinians. It goes on. 35 uses of daughter or granddaughter in reference to Israelis and 15 in reference to Palestinians. 33 uses of father or grandfather in reference to Israelis, just nine in reference to Palestinians. 30 uses of husband in reference to Israelis, just five in reference to Palestinians. 25 uses of son or grandson in relation to Israelis, 11 in reference to Palestinians. There's one exception here, wife, 10 in reference to Israelis, 24 in reference to Palestinians. I'd actually be quite interested to know if that's partly due to the killing of the family of Al Jazeera's uh, Gaza correspondent, Wael Dadu, who uh, were killed at the start of November, receiving significantly more news coverage than almost any other incident of Palestinians being killed. That's just me speculating here, so but that's just one example. But in any case, look, far, far, far more Palestinian mothers, grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters, fathers, grandfathers, husbands, sons, grandsons, and indeed wives have been killed than Israelis. Everyone's a tragedy. Each of these are a tragedy, make no mistake. But it's clearly the case that far more, from grandmothers to grandfathers, sons, etc., Palestinians have been killed than Israelis, and yet this 
language is very different when applied to both. So how do you explain that disparity? Look, such words I've just used here, mother, grandmother, and so on, that humanizes people, doesn't it? It stops them just being the statistics, lifeless statistics I mentioned before. What it does, that language, is emphasize they were people who were loved, who had families, who have left behind grieving loved ones. That is, if the rest of their family survived. In the case of Gaza, of course, repeatedly, over and over again, entire bloodlines are being wiped off the face of the earth forever. Now, it's true the analysis actually shows the word killed is used more in reference to Palestinians and Israelis. It's used 1,066 times in relation to Israelis compared to 1,630 in reference to Palestinians. But again, note, far, far, far more Palestinians have been killed. So the word killed is being used far more per Israeli violent death than it is per Palestinian violent death. Indeed, while died is used in reference to Israelis 82 times, it's used 201 times with Palestinians. As for emotive words, murder or murdered is used 101 times in reference to Israelis compared to one time in reference to Palestinians. So he might go, well, look, come on, an airstrike killing lots of people is extremely horrific, but it's different to someone just going up to someone and shooting them. Well, look, if you take that approach, we'll have to beg to differ. There's ample evidence that Israel is deliberately killing civilians. I make no apology for saying that. The so-called Daher Doctrine, first developed in the 2006 Lebanon War to deliberately kill civilians uh, to put pressure on civilian populations to achieve political goals is clearly um, in action in Gaza. And indeed, 972 magazine, using leaked information from Israeli military intelligence sources, makes it abundantly clear that Palestinian civilians are clearly being deliberately killed. Um, in any case, what of the fact that several Palestinians have been objectively murdered in the West Bank alone in this time period, in ways extremely comparable, actually, to the way that many Israeli civilians were killed on the 7th of October? The West Bank, as you, you will know, is, of course, not run by Hamas. Now, as for other emotive words, well, massacre or massacred is used 23 times in reference to Israelis. It's used just once in relation to Gaza. That, for me, actually just sums up the whole problem with Western media coverage. Because if it actually reflected reality, we would be referring to what's happening to Gaza as one of the great massacres of our time. But in any case, clearly the BBC does not believe that, for example, wiping out entire bloodlines of Palestinians constitutes a massacre. As for slaughter, or slaughtered, those words, that's used 20 times. 20 times in reference to Israelis. In reference to Palestinians, zero times, not once. What this report reveals is very clear. There's a word for it. We should not shy away from it. It's called racism. And sorry, this really is an example of case closed. They're just bang to rights here. Objectively speaking, the BBC treats Israeli life as having far more weight and importance than Palestinian life. There is no plausible, credible rebuttal to this point that the BBC could ever possibly offer. It is an accurate reflection of what the statistics say. How could the BBC possibly claim otherwise? Now, the defence they would have to instead come up with would have to be why they treat Palestinian life as having so less worth than Israeli life. I will get in touch with the BBC and I will put that to them in these statistics. They don't have a legitimate defence. So it will be interesting to see what they try and come up with if they even bother to respond. Now, certainly it's obviously the case that human la humanising language is used far more in reference to Israeli life than Palestinian life, which is brought into even sharper relief when you take into account the vastly different death tolls and then look at how each word is used per death. It's also the case that emotive language to describe mass death, killing, is used far more in relation to Israeli deaths, and again per Israeli death, than it is in relation to Palestinian deaths, and again per Palestinian death. This study is extremely important for the here and now, and indeed for the historical record of this grave crime. We can clearly see how Palestinians are dehumanised, and we can conclude quite legitimately, that this plays an important role in diminishing public outrage over what should be considered one of the great atrocities of our age. And that therefore this contributes to the further killing, mass slaughter, of Palestinians, because it means less pressure on Western governments who support and arm Israel. So this coverage is not simply a moral affront. It's actually a matter of life and death. It's important to explain why this atrocity is allowed to continue. Indeed, if this is the case with the BBC, we can only imagine how much it must be worse with newspapers which largely overtly support Israel's onslaught. It would be worth doing a separate study on this, but I can frankly just already imagine the results would be absolutely 
appalling. But there we have it. The BBC's coverage of this horror is overtly racist. Objectively so. It strips Palestinians of their humanity as they are slaughtered in vast numbers. I'm using a word there. Note, the BBC refuses to use in relation to Palestinians. And therefore, the BBC should be held to be complicit in this crime of historic proportions. Please like and subscribe. Um, do share this video. I think this is particularly important to get this particular message out. Um, keep the show on the road on patreon.com forward slash 84 Listen to us on the podcast. I will speak to you soon.